Hello plant enthusiasts, plant breeders, passionate people about breeding crops. Hey, this is David Benson, uh, founder and CEO of Cornhusker Hybrids LLC in Lincoln, Nebraska, USA, which is a global plant breeding and maize product development company. Today, we are going to talk about something that's really exciting for me, and that's that's the hybrid B73 by Mo17. Uh, probably the most studied hybrid in corn breeding and maybe in breeding, and probably the most important corn hybrid ever developed, but I also want to uh, leave you with, it was also maybe the best population that was ever developed. So we'll talk about that today. But so generally the people as I know people are going to be watching this and may or may not be familiar with corn. B73 by Mo17 would be the pedigree. The pedigree is written female parent first, male per parent second. In this instance, B stood for the state breeding program at Iowa State, and Mo, M, stood for the same thing in the University of Missouri. So this was a cross between a B set for between an Iowa state inbred, the, the seed parent, and a Missouri inbred, the male parent. So you think of that, and another thing I'm just gonna lay out there so you have it, we call these in the US, some parts of the world, not everywhere, stiff stalks, the female parent, and we'll talk about that, and non-stiff stalks, which are the male parent. In everything, of course, there is a history and a story to. And this hybrid, and particularly the inbred B73, has kind of an interesting history. I'm an Iowa State student, and there'll probably be others that watch this, a legend or <laughs> what is thought actually happened back in the day is that our the technician, Paul White, made his main claim to fame, I think Paul's retired now, pulled B73 out of the proverbial trash can after Dr. William Russell threw it away because it was so bad in the European corn borer nursery. It was just awful. It was probably down at the bottom because if you've ever seen B73, when you inoculate it with corn borers, it looks like a shotgun shot. I mean, there's just like no plant left. So it was actually, the inbred was actually thrown away. Now, as the story goes, when the hybrid data came in the fall, as I've heard, the hybrid was way up there. What that means exactly, whether it won the test or whatever. So Paul White is got in the trash can and pulled the B73 out and the rest is history. About 1972, I think, B73 was released and I think it came, well, I know it came from Iowa Stiff Stock Synthetic which is also where B14, B37, B73, and B84 come from. I think it was like the cycle three, but I'm not 100% sure about that right now. The fact checkers can check me. But it came out of Iowa Stiff Stock Synthetic, which was a population that we used half sim recurrent selection on with IA13 as a tester. Now, I know nothing about IA13, but it produced B73. B73 with Mo17 had unbelievable specific combining ability. And when this hybrid was released, it was able to compete and beat most of the seed company offerings at the time. Now remember, this come from private or university breeding programs, not a corporation. And so you had DeKalb or Pioneer or whoever you had it beat their hybrids. And I remember Stan Jensen telling me he was RD at Pioneer, was the first Pioneer employee, I think in the state of Nebraska, tell me that we couldn't beat it. And the reason they wouldn't, Pioneer stayed off going with it and was losing to it for I don't know how long because of the seed size. And they just, the seed size in B73 is small. Smaller than what you'd want, which means in the production field, it's costlier to produce, right? But it overcame that, plus B73 overcame its awful 
uh, resistance or tolerance to corn borer. It's all full of resistance tolerance to every component except yield. It was terrible for diseases. It was terrible. It was not great for stocks. It wasn't great for roots. It wasn't great for a lot of things. Polio disease resistance, stock rots. But it yielded and out yielded anything. And guess what? That's why it got sold. And that's why we're talking about it today. Now, just for a short sideline, Iowa Stiff Stock Synthetic was actually developed by George Sprague. They used 16 lines, as the story goes, above average for stock quality. I'm not for sure why they were above average for stock quality, but I'm thinking maybe, you know, in those days they harvested corn by hand and no person that was harvesting corn by hand, which was already a terrible job, wanted to bend over all day and pick the plants off the ground to get the ear off. So I'm wondering if that was it. But there was also a, a kind of an interesting way it was developed in that there were 16 lines, they made the eight single crosses, then they made the four double crosses, and then they made the two double double crosses, and then they crossed those together to create the synthetic. So in theory, all 16 lines were represented <laughs> supposedly somewhat evenly. I have no idea how that would actually have pulled out if you would have actually took a sample of what came out of it, what got planted, even say the first cycle. But that's what we have to believe. So, B73 by Mo17, that hybrid, if you grew it today and you took care of it, you treated the seed with the same thing the checks got, and you went to high yield locations and you took care of the field, it would really, something, it can beat a lot of regular hybrids in a given field in a given day soon, still 50 years later, because I believe it was released in 1972. So in maize, we sell specific combining ability in those two particular embryos. We got the right set of alleles coming together and it physically allowed companies, say like Holden's, to immediately be competitive with the major companies because they had the cyber to sell. It wasn't encumbered and they physically built their breeding program like everyone else actually has in the whole entire world around the stiff stock family of B73s and the non-stiff stock side of Mo17 derivatives. Now, there's been other things come in, sure, absolutely. But when you follow, if you go into like the US PVP data and there's all kinds of data, you can spend a year in there if you want. But if you try to follow the pedigrees on some things, which I did, and particularly with Holden's, it was easier to do because they didn't code the inbreds between what the breeders knew then and what they know today. They're exactly the same. LH-119 by LH-51 was a big hybrid. It was 119 by 51. You can look, you can look up the general pedigree of 119 and 51, and it's B73 by Mo17. They're selling hybrids today. They're in the LH-280s or 300, and I don't know where they are now, of course, you know, with the, the you know, Monsanto, Bayer, and everything else, but my guess, those, the things that they're selling today, if you can run the tree back, still go back to B73 by Mo17, and the stiff stocks are gonna have a, a lot of B73 and it just worked over. Non-stiff stock, there's a little more things to work with, but if you're working in a non-pioneer world in the US and most of the world with your non-stiff stocks, they're gonna go back to Mo17, LH51 and stuff. Most of them, particularly the more temperate ones, the 105 and 115s. So besides that being the greatest hybrid that's ever been sold, made whole companies, billions of dollars, totally done on taxpayer funds, not private corporations, is the biggest, most important hybrid ever. And when you look at it and you think that when you go around the world, I don't care if you're white germplasm, yellow germplasm, orange germplasm, most places where at least temperate germplasm is grown, you have essentially B73 in the seed parent just worked over a hundred times. I imagine literally, if you think about it, there's been millions of B73 types made in the last 50 years. I know when, we were, when I was in Pioneer, I mean, you have hundreds of pedigrees that would trash back to B73 and where else are they gonna go? That's where they started. 
And John Hoffbeck, who was a heck of a corn breeder and a, a pretty smart guy and very common sense kind of guy said, he, I heard him say this, that he had spent his whole entire breeding career tearing apart B73 and putting it back together in different ways. So, and again, when you look at some of this, like I'm saying, you can go into the PVP data and you can look at PHI, you can look, which is Pioneer, you can look at LHs, you can look at them. And when you get to the pedigrees, everybody started with B73 and Mo17. At some point, some people used other males. Maybe in the case of Pioneer, they used other males. I don't know, I can't, I do know, but in the case of the seed parents, B73 is clearly represented in every seed parent in the world. It's there somewhere. It just is. And that is totally being incredible. Now, all the genomics we have, all the marker data we have, all the phenotypic data we have, all the phenotype data, all the data we have, you have this and you have literally thousands and millions of genotypes come out. You have the whole world growing essentially an improved version of this hybrid. And really, a lot of it is. It is a better version of the same hybrid when you took the genes and kind of rearranged them, how they combine. How in the world is that possible? How in the world can there have been so much variation, particularly in B73, with all of the faults it had? I mean, we spent time, you've improved the roots, you've improved the stalks, you've improved the stay green, you've improved the disease resistance, you've improved the seed size. And somehow you had to hold enough yield together to sell this thing. How is that possible? Unless there was just some unbelievable amount of genetic variation in this inbred that wasn't tapped originally or was silent, I don't know. So how is it possible? So I would leave you today to just think about, you know, you go out to your breeding nursery, where it goes, ah, there's no variation in corn, you know, it all rose from six inbreds or five, which essentially most modern day maize chirpoism does trace back to maybe a half a dozen inbreds of most of it. But how is that gener diversity that was in those few inbreds still being utilized and manipulated and managed and improved today, 50 years later. How in the world, with what we know about genetics, and we know a lot, is this possible? So I just asked some of you guys, you're breeding, how is this possible? What can we do with it yet? And maybe how we can find something like this in other species or other crops. So I would just close today it's saying next week, I'm going to delve on the periphery or the size, sides of the current PVP inbreds that are available in the U.S., which are essentially free to anyone who wants to use them, uh, and talk to them in, in, in general terms about them. We're not going to get specific. We're going to delve in some things about them that people might be able to use or they may know or they don't know. But I think it'd be very interesting to just delve into something like that because it's not something you've seen talk about. I've seen a few graduate students have done papers trying to figure out combining abilities. I know whole companies are using gene editing and trying to, you know, use all the marker data and everything else there is today to predict the hybrids from these PVPs that they could still sell or what embers to work of and all that stuff's going on. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I want to close with you that I think that B73 by Mo17 is the most remarkable hybrid in the history of the world. And I have absolutely no idea how to explain how it can still be such a factor in maize product development 50 years later. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.